Hello everyone! We just finished building our house, which is pretty dang exciting, but now it's time to build something else. It's time to build my new sewing studio. The one in my last place was an 8x10, which was actually too small to do anything really. This one's going to be 12x16 because that fits into what the local permit restrictions are for where I live. Hello, editing Victoria here. I just want to say that this video is for entertainment purposes only, just to give you an idea of how a building is built. This is not for you to learn how to build a building and then go build one. So, this is just for entertainment, not for instructions on how to build something. You're on your own for that. I'll show you the site. Here's a spot, nice little clear area next to some woods. My dad mowed it for me and hauled over these cement blocks along with some wood to start. There's a camper there, it's going to go away soon, but I think it'll be pretty nice. Lots of nice trees and birds. For a foundation, we're just using pure blocks for the studio. It's simple, it's easy, and it works well for the code, so if we have to move it in the future, we can. We put down black plastic underneath the structure to help stop weeds, because we have a real problem with blackberries here. We just use 2x6s that we nailed together for what it sits on. It's better to use pressure treated, but we had this on hand and didn't feel like spending lots of money on pressure treated wood. Once we have those level, on top of them goes all the floor joists. So we had to haul over a bunch of 2x6s, which is what we were using because, again, that's what we had on hand to make the floor choice. What's that? Floor joists are on a 16 inch center, so there's one every 16 inches, and we had to cut them down to the right length. Then we had to have a couple pieces for all those joists to nail into. I believe it's called the rim joist. And we had to mark them every 16 inches to show where to nail the studs into. When you're building a wall, you put the studs on either 16 or 2 foot centers. You might think it's hard to find and remember to count out 16 inches, but these rulers are marked in red to let you know every 16 inches where to put your stud. So we mark those. These are going to be the pieces on the edge where these studs go, and then you're gonna cut them together so that they're the same. Once you got it all cut and marked out, then you gotta nail the floor joists onto the rim joists and make them all secure. You also want to make sure that they're square and not all crooked and wiggly piggly. Once you got everything all nailed up, it's really important to make sure that the structure itself is square and not like at a weird angle. This is easy to do by measuring from corner to corner diagonally across and making sure that both of the measurements are the same. 241 and a half. Okay. Uh, if they don't match up, you can just use a large hammer to tap on one side until it squares up and is the right dimensions. Once you've got all the square and level and whatnot, you get to put it on the floor. We use three quarter inch tongue and groove plywood for this. You gotta make sure that your first piece is put on straight because all the others work off of it. If the first one is just a little bit off, then they're all gonna go crooked. I kind of feel like half of building a structure is hauling around heavy pieces of wood, and the other half is looking for your tools to see where you misplaced them. At this point, we remembered that we hadn't actually secured the base to the beams that it's sitting on, so we went ahead and did that on the back side. I should probably crawl back under it and secure the front, but really there's so much stuff in there, it's not going to go anywhere. We nailed all of the plywood down to all of the joists. It took a while, but it's pretty easy nailing just straight onto the floor. It's also fun once you get the floor down, because then you can walk around on top of it and see how big your studio is going to be. Now we've finished nailing the floor down, 
I'll show you what's cool about this size. So this is 12 by 16. Plywood comes in 8 foot by 4 foot pieces, so this only uses 6 pieces of plywood. One full one, two full ones, then you want to stagger them. So there's one cut in half, and then a full one, one cut in half, then a full one, and a full one. This equals 196 square feet, which is under 200, which is the code for most places to build a shed without a permit. Now that we have the floor done, it's time to put up the walls. Put the two long walls up first and then fit the other walls in between. We're going to do two by four walls. Two by fours are not actually two inches by four inches. They're a little bit smaller. So if you ever work with wood, keep that in mind. We've got to figure out where the windows are going to go and the door and plan for that. But now we've just got all these 20 foot two by fours left over from building the house. It's a stupid length, but it's what we got. So we're going to do it here. And then over here, you can turn around and there's going to be an ironing table, sewing tables. So that big window is going to go here. It's a good thing we're using this pile of wood because you can't even see that one. All these vines are growing over it, but we've got a lot of leftover wood from building the house. Maybe we'll even get another shed out of it. Building a wall is pretty similar to building a floor. Except for, you know, it stands up instead of laying down. But you gotta mark out where your studs are gonna go. Their studs when they're in the wall, their joists when they're in the floor. We did the walls with 16 inch centers. You can also do two foot centers, but we just thought 16 is a little bit sturdier, and so we went with that. You also have to figure out where your windows are gonna go, because obviously you have to account for that when you're putting the studs in, because you can't just have a stud running straight through your window. You have to put in a top and bottom sill for those to support the window for it to sit on and to screw into. Then you have to put studs underneath them or above them depending on the size of the window so that you still have something to nail the plywood on the outside to. Basically it's still just a bunch of sign and hammering, but I really like putting walls together. They're pretty simple. Then you can use that old diagonal measuring trick to make sure your wall is square because you don't want a crooked wall. Once it's square, you want to put some plywood on it so that it stays in its shape. We used half inch plywood for the walls. It's a lot lighter and easier to manage as well as cheaper. It's a lot easier to put the plywood on the walls while they are laying flat because then you don't have to hold them up while you're nailing them down. My siblings showed up right about now, so we got roped them into helping us lift up the wall. It's really not that heavy with just a couple sheets of plywood on it. My dad and I could lift it on our own, but you know, they like to help. To hold the wall up, you would use a couple braces to stop it from falling down. Secure them to the wall and then to the base. You can use the level at this point too to make sure that they are going to be secure. It's a good idea to put some nails in the bottom too. It always feels really good to get that first wall up. Building others is pretty much the same thing. Lots of measuring, lots of cutting, lots of nailing. If you have nails to pull but you don't have a big nail puller, it works quite well to put a piece of, another piece of wood under your hammer. Then they pull up real easy. Gets you that leverage. Here, I'll do it left handed so you can see it better. Then we're back at it. Day two. It rained the last couple days, so we took some time off. Got this first wall up, so it's time to put the other long wall. My dad cut this 16 footer, which is the length of the building, for the top plate. We're going to use a couple shorter ones for the bottom plate. That is the top plate up there. And the bottom plate goes on the floor and all the studs get nailed into it. So we cut some studs to go in here and I'm going to mark it. You put them both together and mark it so the studs are evenly spaced top and bottom. I'm going to go ahead and do that. You're always going to have one stud here but you just line up with the edge. Then I go along and mark on both sides 
for the 16 inches. So this is a 28 inch window in the middle. So eight is the middle. And eight. yeah, eight takes the middle. Yeah. Okay. And fourteen on either side. Right now. Oh. This wall, we just used the floor to check if it was square or not for some reason. The plywood sheathing yeah, on the outside of the walls six. overhangs about just enough to cover the rim joist down on the bottom. So then this plywood goes all the way down to the bottom of the building and there's nowhere for rain to get into. I nailed it down and then my dad used the saw to cut out the hole for the window opening. To cut that in. Then it was just lots more nailing to nail down all the plywood on the sides. It's like a nail every 16 inches or so. So there's a lot of them. My brother and his wife showed up at just the right time to help us lift the back wall up. This one was a lot heavier since it had so much more plywood on it. Okay. Okay. Ready, set, go! Okay, looking good. Good enough skate till I get some nails in it. We braced it again so that it wouldn't top over before we finished the other walls. I made sure it was level and we nailed it down onto the floor as well. This here is one of the windows. Now it's time to start building on these two side walls. I have to figure out where the windows are going to go in them. The drafting table is going to be on this wall. So it's going to have the biggest window right over it. And then over on this side, we'll have the last window. The height is going to be the same as this one. And then it will be a shed roof that goes up to that wall. I just had my Zoom vintage swimming costume so along meeting. And now we're going to try to get this up. Then that one and the roof between now and the end of tomorrow, because it's supposed to rain on Tuesday. So now you probably get the gist of how a wall is built, so, you know, a lot more cutting, measuring, and nailing. When we were building a house, I didn't do any of the sign myself. My dad was using this really crappy, like, plug-in electrical saw that he got for free somewhere. The button didn't work and it would just coast, so when he stopped cutting it would just keep going until the blade stopped. It's pretty dangerous. A lot of the cheaper ones are like that. Then at the end of the build, of course, I went ahead and bought this one, which has been one of the best things I've bought. Sometimes it really pays to like get decent tools. Having a battery, not a dealing with the cord is great. Plus this one has this safety leveler, like this won't start unless you push on this safety lever as well. And when you let up off the trigger, the blade stops immediately. So I actually feel comfortable cutting with something. Just like when you're sewing and you want to use the right size needle or thread for the fabric that you're using, in carpentry you want to use the right size nail. These are the two most common ones we're using for building this. This is a 16 penny spike. And this is an 8 penny. This is used for nailing the studs to the plate, the top and bottom plates, and for use it for all the joists on the floor. This is the eight penny. We use it for like nailing the plywood to the studs. Nailing's just something that takes practice. Get good at it. Try not to get too frustrated if your nails go crooked when you're learning how to nail. Or even if you've been nailing for a while and they're going crooked. It's okay. Just try to straighten it out and get it going in straight. If it starts in going crooked, you can tap it on the side of the nail with a hammer to get it straight again, and then just continue hammering. I'll also say, not all hammers are the same. There's really big ones, there's smaller finishing ones, plus some of these ones that all look the same, they're not. My sister's favorite hammer doesn't work that well for me. My dad's favorite hammer doesn't work that well for me. But I found this trusty rusty one, and it works great. 
for me. Here you can see we're putting in those sills for the window, like I was talking about, that go above and below the window for it to sit on. It's not possible to put all the plywood on the side walls while they are laying down because the ones on the edges need to overlap with the walls that are standing up. Now you can see behind me what I'm talking about. We're only able to put that piece of plywood in the middle because the sides have to overlap with the edges. Also, you can see the top and the bottom sills of that window that is going to go in over there. When we put the last wall up, we took the braces off of the long walls because they were secured to the other short wall behind us. You gotta cut this, cut this to do a very good job. Mm -hmm. We won't hire him back. The wall got nailed to the other walls and the floor, and then all the walls were up. Once the walls were up, we could start on the roof. We started by making a pattern on how to cut all the roof rafters. They're notched so that they sit on the walls flush. I then put up all the hurricane ties while my dad cut the roof rafters. Hurricane ties are what the rafters sit in and they get nailed into. They attach the roof to the walls. You pop a bottle a week, huh? No. Here's where we got to the other day. Got all the rafters up. We're just using 2x4s for the rafters. They'll be plenty strong. No one's going to be walking around on the roof except for when we're doing the roof. It's pretty funny though because I was thinking back to when we did the rafters for our house and they were 2x12s. Got a great big window here over the cutting table. It's going to be a pretty nice view. Smaller window here. Another big window here. Gonna put the slider here. I think I've decided to go with the slider. Just need to figure out which one and order it. But tomorrow we'll put the roof plywood up, put some tar paper on it. Then once the roof is up, we'll measure how big it is to order the metal roofing. Then we gotta put the rest of the plywood on the walls. Then, you know, Put the windows in, electrical, drywall, insulation, insulation before the drywall, all that, and we'll be done. For those of you that are interested, we used half inch plywood on the roof as well. Lifting plywood on the roof isn't as hard as you would think, but still, it's not something I do for fun. You lift it up. Easy, you pushed me right off. I only got so much room up here. We also went ahead and put the rest of the plywood on the walls. You can see how it overlaps the front wall here, like I was talking about earlier. videos or something where people are making a costume and they're like I just whipped this up out of stuff in my stash and you're like gosh I wish I had 15 yards of silk in my stash that's how I always feel anyway but watching this I realized I kind of like that but with wood I'm like we just made this out of leftover wood from our house but now our wood stash really is pretty much gone because we built my husband's office now too Honestly, my dad did most of the roof of my studio. I'm not the biggest fan of heights and ladders. I did do the roof on our house though, but that was a much larger surface area, so I wasn't so worried about falling off the edge. Here's how the roof looks. Plywood staggered like the floor is. And it's just nailed down along all the rafters. Here's a little over eight sheets of plywood and put some scraps in there too. Next we have to put the tar paper down, and then we have to measure this as well to order the metal roofing. Windows going in is always a lot of fun. It really makes the place feel more like a space and not just a windy old shed. The inside's come along. Dad's working on putting those side pieces up. 
we have one window in. Still need to decide what door is going here. Looked online, couldn't find the ones I wanted anymore. I don't know if you know this or not, but a lot of those sliding panels and windows come out to make them easier to lift and so that you can clean them easier from the second story without needing a giant ladder. I didn't know that before, so I think that's pretty cool. I'll hold it going. You want me to put a couple? When I picked out what windows to buy, specifically look for ones with these nailing fins because that's how you attach it to the wall. Sometimes when you buy windows secondhand, these have been cut off when they take the window out of the house. So, these are make it a lot easier. Manch find a brand new sliding glass door on Craigslist. The guy just had it stand in his garage because it didn't fit in his house. It involved a trip off island with a trailer, which is kind of expensive on the ferry coming home, but it was much cheaper than buying a new one, so I feel like it was definitely worth it. I wanted to have as much light in the studio as possible, so I feel like it was a great deal. Putting in this standard size sliding glass door felt like a cakewalk compared to the ones we put in earlier in the year, which were 12 feet by 8 feet. Those ones were a monster and took four people. This one was easy. Once we had the door in, we were able to put on the rest of the plywood on the front of the studio. My dad put some metal trim on the seam where those two went together to stop water from getting in, and I nailed down everything. We went and got the slider this morning. It's perfect. So we put that in. Just got to finish putting the plywood up there. And then it's time to start putting in the receptacles. So this is a receptacle box. And then it gets nailed to here, and that's where the outlets are going to go. So it's time to figure out the electricity more, figure out where I'm going to put all of the outlets. I figure I should probably put more than I think I need, but I have nine boxes, so I'll probably just put nine. Then I also have to figure out where I'm going to put the light switch, probably right next to the door, and then figure out where I want lights. Maybe one over there and one over here, definitely one over here, quite possibly one over there, or do I want lamps? Big decisions. Gone around the room. Place my receptacle boxes about where I want them to be. Now I gotta hammer them onto the wall at the right height. There are these little edges here that you want to have sticking out, for that's for the width of the drywall. Just gonna use my hammer as the height for them so then they're all at roughly the same height. else is having this problem but like all of my clothes have started falling apart during quarantine these just have to last a little bit longer good patch them but I'm sick of wearing them now it's time to drill some holes so that I can run the wire through the walls. I drill through all the studs so that I can put the wire through. I'm gonna go at a height a little bit above the boxes, but below this window, and I'll just do a consistent height all the way around the room so then I know where the wire is. This drill is something else that I bought towards the end of the home build that I really wish I had bought earlier. Having my own little compact drill that works well has been so handy. I've really gotten my money's worth out of it. Between building this and putting together furniture, I use it all the time. It's great. I don't know why I didn't buy one earlier. 
This video is not sponsored by DeWalt, but if they want to give me some power tools to review, I'd be okay with that. In the corners, there's a couple places where the drill is too big to fit in between the studs. So I'm going to put this thing on it and then come through the one next to it and be able to drill. Put in a hole here for a exterior outlet. I've got 50 feet of electrical wire, get a string in between all the outlets, and let's see how much I get done before lunch. Spoiler alert, I did not have enough. Always just buy the 100 foot roll, at least, because you're gonna need more than you think, and it will come in handy later. At least, if you build stuff, it will. I don't know about the average person. When the metal for the roof came in, we had to get it all up there. We had already put tar paper up there, but then all we had to do was lift all these sheets of metal up there and screw them down. We're really big fans of this metal roofing instead of shingles because it's so much quicker to put up. Plus, it lasts for so much longer and is much more sturdy. The light in here is very orange. Clearly, I'll need to drywall and paint it. But my dad's up on the roof, and while he's been up there, I came in and I put in the light switch box and ran that cord, that wire, and then I put in the one overhead light I'm going to have is going to be over my drafting table. So that's kind of box that you put to put a ceiling light in. So we got that in. I got more electrical wire. So he has the drill right now. I'll have to get it from him and then I can drill, have to drill back through all these studs so then I can travel along one of these rafters to that. Our roof calculations didn't quite work out perfectly, so we have to saw a bit of the wood roof off so they'll be covered by the metal. And then that'll probably be it for the morning because it's Friday. And Friday means pastry Friday, which is when my family gets together and eats pastries every week for like the entire year. I don't know. Since we've been building the house anyway. Great tradition, highly recommend it. Went and got a big pile of insulation yesterday. This is one of the most expensive parts of building the studio. I mean, if you count like the roof is one thing, the floor is one thing. I guess the studs and plywood for the walls would have probably been one of the most, but since I had almost all that on hand, this is the thing that I've spent the most money on so far. Just got like the cheap one. There's nicer stuff that's less itchy to work with, but, you know. I'm gonna tidy this place up a little bit. My dad stuck some of his stuff in here when he was cleaning out his trailer. I think I'm gonna put some more supports up there for my gravity-fed iron. One thing you should always do whenever you have your walls open is take pictures. Because it's really handy to know where all the studs are and where the wires go, if you have any pipes in your house. There aren't any here, but we've definitely been referring a lot to the photos I took in the house to see where we can hang stuff. I wish I had better ones than I did, so always take more than you think you need. I stuck a 2x6 in the ceiling for my gravity iron, so I didn't have to worry about finding the narrow roof rafter. I'm a fan of note taking, so what I did in my house, it was super helpful, was to show where each wire comes into the receptacle. So there's four different slot bots that wires can come into the receptacle box and I'm showing where it comes from and which hole it goes into. It's a simple little diagram and I'm numbering each box. This is number eight. And then I'm also tucking the wires up in the box to make it easier for insulating and drywalling. 
Doing this diagram is really helpful if you are going to like use a spray paint to paint your house. We subbed out the drywall in because drywall is a pain. And they used a spray method of putting on paint for the primer. And it sprayed over all the notes I had written on the wires of which ones were hot or where they went. So when I had this map, it like saved the day. We're just gonna use paint rollers. It's not gonna be a big deal. But in a few years, if I wanna like change something, I'm not gonna remember which wires are which. This may come in handy. One thing I didn't know in my house diagram, which would have been kind of handy to note, is which side the stud is on in the box. Because knowing where these are, knowing that they're attached to a stud, is a pretty easy way to find the studs when you're when they're all covered up with the drywall and you're looking for somewhere secure to hang into. So I'm just gonna mark those with a solid air line. One thing that I really like about working with wood and just building in general is the smells of it. Like I would come in here the last few days when I was drilling all the holes, especially when we we're cutting it, just that smell of fresh cut wood is so good. And now I just came in here and like the smell of the insulation. It's just so specific and kind of fun. Don't really get that much from working with fiber because it usually just smells like your laundry detergent. Putting up insulation isn't that fun, but it also isn't that hard. It gets stapled up onto all the studs. It's a little bit of an itchy job. It's good to wear long sleeves and trousers and cover up for it. When you're putting insulation around the wires, you split it down the middle in the thickness wise, if you know what I'm saying, so that the insulation goes on both sides of the wire. You also just cut around the receptacle boxes to leave a space yeah. for them. It's been about a month since I've worked on my studio. I got a couple jobs, one of them ended, so that's good, it was a short term thing. And then I was really busy with CocoVid, if you haven't seen those videos, go check them out. And now I have some time again, so gonna have to do some drywalling. It's mid-August now, we got it all insulated, my dad did finish insulating for me. We ran out so we couldn't put some there, but... Don't tell anyone and it will be okay. I got most of the materials I need. I got the mud and I got the tape, but we just need to get the drywall itself. So my dad's clearing off his trailer so we can go to the lumber yard and get that. My brother and I went in on a drywall hoist together because I have to drywall this place. My brother is building a home office and then his wife is going to build a studio. Just this size they're all building too. And then my husband looks like he's going to be working from home for the next foreseeable future as well. Even when things go back to normal, he's going to work from home a few days a week. So we have to build him an office next. And I would really like a dark room. So, I mean, once we build that many buildings, we might as well get a drywall hoist because drywall is freaking heavy. And lifting it up on the ceiling is a real pain. Drywall. Not that fun, but it looks really good when it's done. Here comes the pork middle. I don't know why I let my dad convince me by 12 foot long pieces of drywall. Yeah, it goes a bit faster, but man, they are hard to handle. Don't worry, we put a heck of a lot more screws in before we took the hoist down. I just didn't think you wanted to watch us put screws in for ages.
When we were putting the drywall on the walls, I had the very important task of sitting against it to hold it up while my dad cut the holes out for the receptacle boxes. They're kind of hard to find when you've covered them up. We were just measuring, but my brother got this nifty little tool that is a magnet thing. You stick in the receptacle box and then you stick something to it. And it helps you find where the receptacle box is, so you trace it and like, cut it out or something. I don't know, but I'm excited to use it for our next building. Don't worry that we're covering up the window here. You cut those out later. Drywall's easy to cut. You just score down the line and then snap it and then cut it off. Once all the drywall was hung and screwed into place, it was time to start prepping for mudding, which includes taping over all the seams with this yellow mesh tape. Drywalling and mudding is something I know the gist of, but not the finer details. I should probably go watch some YouTube videos on it sometime. But we are not drywallers, so don't be learning from us. I mean, don't be learning from us for any of this. This is just for entertainment purposes. But you know, go find someone else for your drywall technique tips. Basically though, what you do is you take this mud and you fill in all the cracks and seams and everything with it. Then you fill in all the screw holes and anything else, and then you let it dry, and then you sand it down, then you come in, and you fill in a little bit more, and then you sand it down, and you let it dry, and then you fill in a little more, and you keep sanding it down forever. We got all the drywall up, and I put mud in the gaps going along the walls. As you can see, there's big gaps on the window sills, and also at the ceiling, and at the corners. So those get treated a little differently. I also covered up all the, the screw heads. So my dad's working on the corners. You put a bunch of mud in the corner and then you take this sort of paper, fold it down the crease, stick it into the corner and put mud over it again. So he's doing that in the corners and in the ceiling, which creates a nice edge. I've been working on the window edges and so I put a bunch of mud in here to fill it in. And then I've been using this metal. It's like a metal corner with paper on it. And so once I've mudded to fill that in, stick this on there and mud over it to make it a little bit smooth. So this is just the first coat. So it's pretty rough as you can see, but it has a lot of mud there. So it's gonna take a couple days to dry. And then we're gonna come back in and do another coat to smooth it out. Do a bunch of sanding, but it's coming along. It looks, I'm pretty happy with it. We've probably done four, maybe five touch-ups of the drywall now, probably four. Three if you don't include the first mudding. We could keep going, it's not perfect, but we're not drywallers. It would take many more coats to get this perfect. My dad wanted to do some more touch-ups, but I'm like, no one's gonna be climbing on a ladder up in the cracks with a flashlight looking at it. My bookcase is in, it's gonna be fine. I wanna move on to painting. So I have to vacuum up all this dust and then I get to prime. I finished priming, looks pretty good. Took exactly one gallon. Got a little messy though. So I'm gonna go clean up, have some lunch, and then paint the second coat. It's been fun thinking about how carpentry and building a building is like sewing. And every 
time we do something, I'm always like, ooh, it's starting to look like a real thing now. So it's kind of like that, where you put the walls up and you're like, ooh, it's starting to look like a real place. How it really doesn't. It's like when you do up the side seams and you're like, ooh, it's starting to look like a real shirt now. But it's not, it's hardly there. Then you put on, you know, you put in the insulation, you put on the drywall and you're like, it's really starting to take shape. It's like a real building now. It's kind of like when you either have a really good mock-up or you have it all sewn together for the first time and you're trying it on for the first time and you're like, yeah, this is like a real garment. But you still have a lot of work to do. You still have to, you know, put the collar on or finish sewing your seams, do all the decorative in the trim. Then you paint the house, the studio, and it's like, yeah, this is like a real place now. But you're still not done. You gotta, you know, put in the stuff, put on the trim. It's fun to think about. My studio is all painted. I have to touch up a few spots because white on white is so hard to paint. But it looks pretty good. It's just all white with a white ceiling. I debated for a while if I was going to put down flooring or not because, you know, it's a big expense. Well, you know, a couple hundred dollars or something. I thought about just painting the plywood subfloor, but it kind of got beat up while we were working. So I decided I might as well put the flooring in now because if I don't put it in now, I'd never put it in once all the furniture is in. You want to have this. Yeah, so that it... I just got a cheap laminate flooring, but I actually really like how it turned out. This snap and lock like laminate flooring is so easy to put in. I got an underfloor laminate that adds a little bit of R value to it because I didn't put any insulation in the floor itself, mostly due to cost. And I wanted to make it a little bit warmer on my feet. My dad talked me into shellacking my baseboards. It's not the color I would have chosen, but he had it on hand, so you know, it was free. At this point is a good time to go ahead and put in the receptacles. I don't know why the one I filmed was one where we cut a terrible sized hole around it, but whatever. Doing the outlets is not that hard, though, you know, you really want to make sure the power is out. I knew the power was out because there is no power hooked up to the studio at this point. You should only do this if you feel comfortable and know what you're doing, so I'm not going to tell you how to do this. But you can learn if you want to, you know, at your own risk. I did all the electrical for our house and didn't have any previous experience. So I'm definitely someone that believes that you can learn how to do anything you want to do. Even if it seems intimidating. Just get some reputable sources, get some, learn from people who know what they're talking about, and you can do it. hard time finding a light in stock anywhere that I could afford for my studio, but I managed to find one at my local hardware store that did the job. We finished the studio! It's super echoey in here because there's nothing in here, but we got some baseboard trim down. We don't even have baseboard trim in our new house, so that's pretty fancy. Uh, it's not quite the color I would have chosen, but it's what we had on hand, so better done than perfect. Plus most of it's going to be covered by stuff anyway. But now I get to move in my furniture, which I'm super excited about. For furniture, I used a mixture of new stuff I got at Ikea and old furniture that I already had in my previous studio. I really like putting together furniture, so that's good because I had two bookcases to put together as well as two dressers. I'm really excited to have these bookcases because my old ones were crappy and these ones are much sturdier.
sure to always secure your bookcases to the wall. I feel like this is something I've never really done in the past, but totally should have. Now I don't have to worry about an earthquake tipping it over on me. Very yellow out today. Very overcast because of the wildfire smoke. But it's time to build some of my furniture. Last night I put together the bookcases. They look dandy. And now I'm going to put together my drafting table, which I'm very excited about. I debated a lot about what I wanted to use for my drafting, drawing, cutting table, whatever you want to call it. I didn't want to just copy Bernadette with hers, but it just seemed like such a good idea to use the dressers with the big countertop on top. I thought about building my own and I just didn't want to have open shelves because I don't like the open clutter like that. I'm really excited about having all these drawers to put my stuff in. I just think it's the best idea. It definitely took me the better part of a day though. These have a lot of pieces and a lot of parts. Overcast skies and smoggy conditions in the region are expected to continue into the weekend, according to Brian Garcia, a meteorologist with the National Weather Service. But the duration of unhealthy air quality is something we have not seen before. When I opened up the packages, I was like, wow, this is not the color I expected it to be. I don't know about this. It's actually quite a gray, and I thought I was getting the dark brown. But, you know what, I'm actually really glad that I got these ones because the dark brown would have just melded into the floor and the countertop. The ones I got, I got these just because they were like the only ones in stock when I went to Ikea. I think tomorrow we gotta go to the recycle center because this is a bit much. We gotta tidy up all our old tools and stuff. But it's so smoky out today that the ferry has its foghorn going. Let me just say that I have no effing idea how Bernadette got her countertop on herself. That thing is so heavy and it's so sturdy and so nice. I thought about using a piece of plywood, but then I thought I might as well just pay the money and get something really nice that I'll really enjoy. Once I had my table in, I was able to hang the light so I knew how high I wanted it to be. However, I kind of hung it too low still. Oh well. Once I got some things on the wall, the studio is pretty much done. I moved in all my stuff and I've been working in it for a little while. It's working out really nice. I'm gonna do a separate video that gives you a tour of it all. I'm gonna try to have that out next week. I'm also gonna have a separate video on my ironing table, which is right in front of me there, as well as my ironing system. I hope you enjoyed this video. It was pretty long, but you know, it takes a while to build a studio. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about carpentry. Let me know, leave me a comment, and tell me what you found was the most interesting part of building a studio, or if you learned something cool. I'm really excited to give you a tour though, so check back later, and I hope you all have a great week. Bye!